Hello Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Welcome to my podcast. My name is Joseph Anthony. Today I'm going to be talking about this photograph that I published recently on social media. I got to thinking there were some quite useful learning points for photographers with this image. With these podcasts, I'm planning to do short form, quick sort of tips and insights into a particular image, and then a longer form version, which is behind the paywall. So you can get a 60 second, up to 60 second uh, freebie uh, insight. And then if you want to learn more about my thinking and teaching behind the uh, photograph in question, then through my Patreon, you can sign up and that will be posted on YouTube as a private link for Patreon subscribers only. So without further ado, let's dive into this particular photograph. So first of all, it was captured in Maipo uh, Nature Reserve, uh, which is on the border of Hong Kong and mainland China in Deep Bay. And the tide moves in and out daily. And this affects uh, obviously the tide level and uh, how many animals such as uh, mudskippers and small fish that can be found in Deep Bay. And of course, the birds that uh, migrate and congregate here they're aware of this and they will come to Deep Bay to fish for food. So when I go into a, a, a scene such as this, first of all, I get pretty excited because with so many birds around, the photographic potential and the actual potential is obviously uh, elevated. But on the flip side, it's a bit of a challenge because there's a lot of noise in terms of uh, subject matter. And really what you're trying to do is find a story, find some compositional balance. Yeah, come up with ideas based around that. So it can be tricky, but it's a it's a fun challenge. So on this particular occasion, the tide is moving in from the left of the picture towards the right uh, and from the back to the front. And so the birds know this. What happens is the, the, the water level rises and they move with it and they and they uh, they're looking out for mud, for mud skippers particularly so the optimal timing for them to feed is is kind of just when the water levels rising so the thing about this scene which sort of formed the idea in my mind was that for large periods of time the quite a lot of the the egrets in particular are stationary they're not moving because they're looking out very carefully for activity under the water near their feet but of course, some will also be walking. So the idea here is to is to take it from a literal to a more abstract or artistic looking uh, shot and using that combination of some still birds combined with moving birds, potentially to create uh, sort of artistic strokes, if you like, as the birds move or as the birds fly. Furthermore, I'm also trying to use the reflections of the birds and the reflections of the skyscrapers that you can see uh, in the water. And of course, keeping an eye on compositional uh, interest and compositional balance, which is probably the biggest challenge here because there's so many birds around. So the idea is trying to find something harmonious within all that action. Don't forget, of course, that, uh, that the tide's continuously shifting uh, and so are the birds as well. So the scene that I sort of set my eyes on initially is constantly changing and I have to try and reposition and adapt. Anyway, the uh, the other decision is, of course, what lens and what focal length to use. In this particular case, the birds were relatively far away, prompting me to have to use a telephoto lens. But then the problem with the telephoto lens is that I can't get, I can't easily get a large depth of field to keep things in focus from front to back. Not too much of an issue anyway, because I'm trying to go for a more abstract arty shot. So optimal sharpness isn't really the objective. However, I still want to have some sense of, of focus and something to draw your eye to, even though I also want it to wander around a bit. It can't be too soft everywhere. So purely on a depth of field decision issue, if you're using a long telephoto lens, that's a consideration and, and a bit of a challenge. Because if I stop the lens down to say, f22 which is like the minimum in this situation what you find is you end up with needing a uh, very slow shutter speed and or a higher iso now it just so happens this was in the middle of the day so there's a lot of bright sunshine 
it sort of makes the ISO decision a little bit easier because I've already decided that I want to go for a slower shutter speed to convey movement if any occurs. However, referring back to that situation I was describing where I wanted to have something uh, to focus on with the eyes and not have the image be too soft with a long telephoto lens at slow shutter speeds it's very easy to get motion blur so your technique in terms of how you try to uh, achieve some sharpness at a very slow shutter speed with a long telephoto lens is something that needs to be considered we can talk about that in another uh, tutorial but basically the the, the the challenge here is to find a shutter speed that will likely give you the effect that you want and then figure out based on that number whether you can or can't get the image to be sharp uh, if you still hand hold the lens. Now in this case it was it was a long telephoto lens of 400 millimeters so the fact is I'm not definitely not going to get anything sharp hand holding even with something like vibration reduction uh, or stabilization image stabilization set on the lens or in the camera. So I have to have the camera on a tripod or some sort sort of other support structure such as the side of the bird hide, a panning plate, a bean bag, a combination of all those things. And then even consider using a cable release and mirror lockup uh, as other options and ways to mitigate the chance of any any excess movement occurring when I finally uh, trip the shutter. Ultimately you do have to obviously accept the higher risk of failure with attempting this kind of shot but I always feel that um, the rewards potentially are, are worthwhile and it's certainly fun uh, trying to get uh, the ultimate effect and sometimes you end up with surprising results things that you don't even uh, you know consider or expect or were part of your initial vision and that's part of the fun of using longer exposures in photography and I highly encourage people to practice that and not be afraid of experimenting. So hopefully that gives you some idea of the thought process behind creating images such as this. There is more available for those who are signed up as patrons on my Patreon. I will go into a deeper dive of uh, the compositional aspects and considerations and just a little bit more on the technique side of shooting something like this. However, what I will add is uh, just a bit about the post-processing. Now, if you paid attention earlier, you might have picked up that, or you should have picked up that I, I mentioned this was shot in a lot of available light in the middle of the day. And that might then cause you to question how I got the, the sort of twilight hour looking blue colors. Well, as I ad openly admitted at the beginning, this is an image uh, designed to be more artistic and more abstract and for that reason I've also uh, taken the artistic license in post-processing because I shoot in RAW it's much easier for me to adjust white balance uh, and tint in, uh, in post-production so using Lightroom I took what was originally a much uh, warmer colored image obviously because it was shot in the middle of the day and I took it down in white balance towards the uh, the more blue tones and then I went further went a step further creatively and I used a split toning technique and this is where you colorize the highlights or and or the shadows uh, in varying amounts and in varying colors depending on your taste and preference you can do this manually I mean you've probably seen millions and millions of adverts on on social media selling you presets I'm a strong advocate against any any buying of presets yeah if there's a very specific look and a very specific need and you don't want to try to replicate it yourself then fine go ahead and buy somebody's preset but generally speaking that's going to not make your images stand out I mean they might in the short term um, because it's an effect but the chances are that because you're not the only one who's uh, using that particular preset coloration your images won't stand out because people will have seen that particular color sort of presentation somewhere else and ultimately the effect of trying to get attention through the use of a preset has been negated or erased um, for that reason 
So I encourage people to learn how to do their own colorization if they are going to go down this more interpretive artistic uh, route with their photography and learn how to split tone and make up your own recipes so this is just a recipe i came up with i can talk you know obviously in, a, in another podcast or another tutorial about the specifics yeah basically in post-production i adjusted the white balance and then i adjusted then i created my own split toning recipe and applied that on top of the uh, white balance adjustment that resulted in this final image here so i hope you enjoyed this uh, brief explanation of the thinking behind this photograph. Uh, your feedback's welcome and I look forward to talking to you again more about another photograph in future. If you're interested in signing up for the long form version of my explainer audio uh, podcasts then I can point you to my Patreon uh, website link which is www.patreon.com forward slash joseph Anthony. J-O-S-E-P-H-A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.